Hello and welcome. When we considered all the topics that we could talk about, why in the world would we be talking about hope right now? We live in a time of pandemic, in a time of crisis, in a time when it seems like the whole world is coming apart. Why would we be talking about hope? Well, it has to do with the fact that we as Adventists are hardwired to hope. You see, our relationship with Jesus Christ predisposes us to a condition of peace. Notice what the Apostle Paul writes. In Romans chapter 5, starting in verse 1, it says, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Our personal relationship with Jesus Christ means that we already have a sense of that peace that God desires for each and every one of his beings. In verse 2, it says, By whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. It's true that around us things seem to be falling apart. But for us, we see hope in everything. As soon and as long as there is an opportunity to share Jesus Christ, we know that there is hope. Do you have this hope? The hope that's mentioned here continues in verse 3. It says, And not only so, but we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience. And patience experience, and experience hope. And hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. For when we were yet without strength, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. It's true that we live in troubled times. But does that mean that we are without hope? Or does that mean that our hope is soon to be fulfilled? There might be trials. There might be tribulations around us. But we still have a message to share. The message of the righteousness of Christ, which brings with it a justification for each and every sinner that would call upon the name of the Lord. That message is our message at this time, just as it has always been the message of God's Advent people. This message that brings to light so clearly our dependence upon our Savior is the message that the world needs to hear so desperately at this time. In Testimonies to Ministers, on page 118, we're given this really important instruction. It says, The perils of the last days are upon us. And in our work, we are to warn the people of the danger they are in. Let not the solemn scenes which prophecy has revealed be left untouched. If our people were half awake, if they realized the nearness of the events portrayed in the Revelation, a reformation would be wrought in our churches, and many more would believe the message. We have no time to lose. God calls upon us to watch for souls as they that must give an account. Right now, things are happening around us and people need to know what the, those things are. But for you and me, what message then are we actually giving? Let's go back to the statement. It continues. Advance new principles and crowd in the clear-cut truth. It will be as a sword cutting both ways. But be not too ready to take a controversial attitude. There will be times when we must stand still and see the salvation of God. Let Daniel speak. Let the revelation speak and tell what is truth. But whatever phase of the subject is presented, uplift Jesus as the center of all hope the root and the offspring of David, and the bright and the morning star. You know, in this time, you may be tempted to look around you and see the signs that are taking place and be so focused upon them that you think that you can scare people into an acceptance of the present truth. It does not work this way. It's true that in this world right now, 
We have pandemic. In this world right now, we have economic distress. In this world right now, we have social injustices taking place. And yet the message that God has given to his people remains the same. Share Jesus Christ with everyone that you meet. Share your experience of what Christ has done for you and souls will be converted. This is a reformation that is needed among us as it is needed in the whole world. To preach Jesus Christ and him crucified is our message, our central message, our necessary message, our theme at this time. In Signs of the Times, on March 17th of 1887, a warning is given to us. It's the sixth paragraph of that article, and it presents there a warning that each of us need to understand when sharing the gospel at this particular time. It says, The shortness of time is frequently urged as an incentive for seeking righteousness and making Christ our friend. This should not be the great motive with us, for it savors of selfishness. Is it necessary that the terrors of the day of God should be held before us, that we may be compelled to right action through fear? It ought not to be so. Jesus is attractive. He is full of love, mercy, and compassion. He proposes to be our friend, to walk with us through all the rough pathways of life. Right now, there is one message to share, the same message that God's people have been sharing from the beginning, the message of the righteousness of Christ. This message is attractive. This message draws souls to the cross of Jesus Christ. And yet, in this world, we are seeing more and more that divisions are taking place. That we are being told that we need to divide ourselves one from the other. That one is better than the other because of their economic status, because of their ethnic group, because of where they live, because of their zip code. None of these things matter in the eyes of God. For the Lord, the origin of all nations is the same. In Genesis chapter 9, verse 18 and 19, it says that the sons of Noah that went forth of the ark were Shem and Ham and Japheth, and Ham is the father of Canaan. These are the three sons of Noah, and of them was the whole earth overspread. We have one common ancestor for all of us. There is nothing that divides us except when we look to self. This is why in Genesis chapter 11, after the experience of the Tower of Babel, the people were divided to scatter across the earth as God had intended them to be. In Genesis 11, verse 8 and 9, it says, The Lord scattered them abroad from thence upon the face of the earth, and they left off to build the city. Therefore is the name of it called Babel, because the Lord did there confound the language of all the earth. And from thence did the Lord scatter them abroad upon the face of all the earth. Their languages were divided, but they themselves were still to understand that they were one people, that God had a common desire for all of them. That one nation has no distinctions with the Savior. In fact, in Romans chapter 10 and verse 12, the apostle writes, there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. The Lord is concerned with only one thing. He is looking to see if you have accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. This is the one and only thing that the Lord is looking at. You may be at one point in your journey towards the cross of Christ. I may be at another point. Another may be at another point. But if all of us have our eyes fixed upon the cross of Christ, then the Lord looks at each one of us and says, you are my child, and lifts us up to him. In Testimonies for the Church, volume 7, 
page 225, it says, Christ came to this earth with a message of mercy and forgiveness. He laid the foundation for a religion by which Jew and Gentile, black and white, free and bond, are linked together in one common brotherhood, recognized as equal in the sight of God. You know, I'm speaking to you today from Sacramento, California. And when I'm preaching in the church here, or one of the other churches that we have in this area, and I look at the congregation, and I see the mix of people that are gathered there, I recognize that this group of people could only be brought together by the Lord. Under any other circumstances, we probably would never mix with each other. But I look out at the congregation, and I see people from so many different ethnic backgrounds, from different economic situations of life, different kinds of households, different ages. And I look at the congregation and recognize that only God could put together a group like this. Because the world would seek to divide us one from another. They would tell me to spend less time with people who are older than me, or younger than me, or from a different background than me, from a different family group than me. But the Lord says that I consider all of you one people. Where the world will seek to bring you apart, I will bring you together. As the statement said, whether we are black or white, free or bond, we are all linked together into that one common brotherhood. Continuing this same thought, in Review and Herald, October 17th, 1899, it says, Christ has made all one. The Bible declares that all human beings are to be respected as God's property. So then, what is the Lord looking for? If he's not looking at these distinctions, what is the Lord actually looking for? In Ephesians chapter 2, starting in verse 13, the apostle writes, Now in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace, who hath made both one, and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us. The Lord himself has broken down the barriers that would divide us one from another, not because we're the same, but because we are on the same journey, a journey towards the cross of Christ. In Ephesians 2 verse 19, it says, Now therefore you are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and the household of God. While this world is tearing itself apart, the people of God have hope a hope that is bound up in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. When we look to the cross of Christ, we all are one. All of God's children bound together by that one common hope of salvation. For this reason, in the Spirit of Prophecy, in Selected Messages, Book 2, page 343, it says the black man's name is written in the book of life Beside the white man's, all are one in Christ. Birth, station, nationality, or color cannot elevate or degrade men. The character makes the man. What is the one and only thing that the Lord is looking at? Your character. Now, on the one hand, when I read that, I get a little bit scared. Because I recognize that my character is far from the character that God would want to look at. And then I recognize something. As I accept Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior, as I accept his righteousness, as I accept his justification, he does a work in me which I could not do for myself. As I accept Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior, a transformation occurs. A transformation which is equally available to you and to every single one who is created on this earth. The transformation that produces fruits of repentance. A repentance which is real, which is genuine, which is not simply an I'm sorry but is actually a turning away from sin. 
This is the power that God desires to give to each and every one of us. An acceptance of the righteousness of Christ is an acceptance of his transformation in your life. That is our great hope. That when the Heavenly Father looks at me, he would see not me, but see Jesus Christ crucified for me. My hope then is complete. Then as the statement that we just read says, the Lord looks at me and sees the character of Jesus Christ, sees the righteousness of Christ, and says, this is my child. He has no distinction based on birth, station, nationality, or color. He has distinction based on the character that is found in the righteousness of Christ. But we do have to address the fact that there are real protests taking place today. The protests which are occurring in the United States, in different countries around the world, that highlight injustice, these are real. They're not imaginary. They're not simply political tools. There is actual injustice which is taking place in this world. We must recognize that this injustice exists, but we must determine why. Why does the injustice exist? In Mark chapter 10, verse 42, speaking to his disciples, Jesus said, Jesus called them to him and said unto them, Ye know that they which are accounted to rule over the Gentiles exercise lordship over them, and their great ones exercise authority upon them. In the time of Christ, it was no different than it is today. And today is no different than in the time of Christ. There are those who seek to oppress others. The Spirit of Prophecy explains it this way. In Desire of Ages, page 550, it says, In the kingdoms of the world, the people were supposed to exist for the benefit of the ruling classes. The higher classes were to think, decide, enjoy, and rule. The lower classes were to obey and serve. The people were expected to believe and practice as their superiors directed. This was the world 2,000 years ago, and it is still the world today. There are those who seek to suppress the will and freedom of others. Can that exist among the people of God? In Mark chapter 10, continuing in verse 43 and 44, the Lord gave the instruction, But so shall it not be among you, but whosoever will be great among you shall be your minister, and whosoever of you will be the chiefest shall be servant of all. With God's people, there's no respecter of persons. The Lord looks at each one of us as his child, but nobody is supposed to lord over somebody else. Nobody is to take away the rights of somebody else. Our hope in Jesus Christ, in his salvation, means that we do not participate in the injustices that happen in this world. Consider what's been happening right now. The pandemic has exacerbated a population which generally is bored and unemployed. The majority of people either are underemployed, barely employed, or have a job but still have so much free time. They're bored. You don't have to go to the well to get your water anymore. You don't have to chop wood for the fire. Even if you work a full day, you come home, you've got all this free time. So you've got a population which is generally bored, generally unemployed. And now that population starts to look and observes that it is actually being oppressed. And this oppression is real. There is actual oppression taking place in our society. In their desire, though, to fix that, their solution is sometimes worse than the problem itself. And instead of bringing freedom, they bring more kinds of oppression. Why is that? Well, 
You see, for you and me, our acceptance of the righteousness of Christ produces within us fruits, fruits of repentance and fruits of character where we treat others as we would want to be treated. Obedience then to the law of God makes it manifest that we are not only obedient to the first four precepts in relation to our duty to God, but also in precepts 5 through 10, which are a relationship one with another. Not to defraud one another, not to lie to one another, not to take from one another, not to oppress one another. As a result, we do not participate in these types of activities which are becoming more and more common in this sinful world. What was the government like at the time of Jesus? In Desire of Ages, page 509, it says, The government under which Jesus lived was corrupt and oppressive. On every hand were crying abuses, extortion, intolerance, and grinding cruelty. Yet the Savior attempted no civil reforms. He attacked no national abuses, nor condemned the national enemies. Was it unjust in the time of Christ? Absolutely, it was unjust in the time of Christ. It was terribly unjust. And yet, Christ did not participate in any marches. Why not? Why not? If there was this injustice, what was Jesus doing about the injustice? Let's continue reading. He did not interfere with the authority or administration of those in power. He, who was our example, kept aloof from earthly governments, not because he was indifferent to the woes of men, but because the remedy did not lie in merely human and external measures. To be efficient, the cure must reach men individually and must regenerate the heart. Is there systemic oppression in our world today? Is there systemic racism in our world today? There is. It's the result of individuals who have separated themselves from the righteousness that Christ would have for them. Remember, the righteousness of Christ produces fruit, and that fruit is obedience to the commandments of God. And the commandments of God do not permit us to oppress one another. In fact, one who has submitted themselves fully to the life of Christ would never in any way take advantage of another person. Then why do we have these issues among us? Do we think that a state policy is going to fix this? No policy of the state, no policy of the government at any level is going to be able to fix these issues. Why? Because as we've read here, these are issues of the heart. They must be dealt with individually. Right now, your friends, your neighbors, your colleagues, your classmates, your family, they are waiting to hear of the solution for the problem. And that solution is the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Do you know why racism exists? It exists because we have separated ourselves from those ideals that God would have for his people. In Acts chapter 17, verse 26, it says that God made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth, and hath determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation. The Lord made all of us of one blood. I have hope that God's people will be the ones who share this message in the world today. In Acts chapter 10, verse 35 and 36, it says, But in every nation he that feareth him and worketh righteousness is accepted with him. The word which God sent unto the children of Israel, preaching peace by Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all. Yes, this world is trying to divide us. Satan is trying to divide us. Satan is trying to sow discord in this world, and he is generally being successful. But God's people recognize that Jesus Christ is Lord of all, that it doesn't matter where you are watching this from. If you are watching this from New Zealand, from Fiji, from Japan, from India, from Nigeria, from Brazil, from Mexico, from anywhere, 
same Lord, same Lord of all. In Genesis chapter 3, verse 20, right at the beginning of Scripture, we are told, Adam called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all living. There is then only one race. There is only the human race. We can never allow the enemy of souls to divide us from this one great truth that we are all one and that it's God's desire that all of his children should come together in righteousness. This world will not have peace without Jesus Christ. There will be no peace. There will be no transformation because there will be no regeneration of the heart without Jesus Christ. You ask why we have hope? We have hope because we have Christ. In Selected Messages, book one, page 259, it says the reason for all division, discord, and difference is found in separation from Christ. Christ is the center to which all should be attracted. For the nearer we approach the center, the closer we shall come together in feeling, in sympathy, in love, growing into the character and image of Jesus. With God, there is no respect of persons. God's hope is what springs forward from every single Adventist. We have experienced that hope because we have received the justification of God, which has brought with it his peace and given us hope that even though all these things are happening around us, our hope will be fulfilled. And the Apostle Paul makes that clear. In 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 12, he says that there will be tribulations, but do not worry. Why not? 2 Timothy 1 and verse 12. For the which cause I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed. For I know whom I have believed, and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. This promise that God gives through the apostle is a promise available to you. This day, if you will accept the righteousness of Christ, if you will commit your ways to be his ways, then this promise is yours. He will keep you until that day. The pandemic, social crises, economic crises, none will be able to shake you from that one great truth that you have received and been a partaker of the righteousness of Jesus Christ. God has a plan for you, and that plan is full of hope. 